and everything's good. We're happy. We've been struggling with microphones a little bit. If it uh, starts squealing, it's very clearly Vern's fault. All right, guys, so, so stay on him with that. It's the old guy. It's the old guy who doesn't understand the technology. All right. Uh, all right, so we're going to follow up from what we did this Sunday, talking about uh, love in the context of marriage. Up here with me is my wife. This is my wife, Christina, if you don't happen to know who she is. Uh, and what you should probably know is that it's incredibly uncomfortable to have to preach a sermon about marriage while your wife sits on the front row. <laughs> and so tonight, she will correct all the things I got wrong and point all the ways that I do it wrong, all right? It'll be great. It'll be some good accountability and transparency. Okay, all right. <laughs> she did. I thought I was telling jokes. Never mind. We're, gonna, we're really going to get into it. All right, fantastic. All right, so she's going to help us out. A couple of the things. Uh, here in a moment, we're going to pass around an attendance sheet. That's something that we do just to track and see how people are engaging and what they're doing. If you happen to not have your name on that, if you could just write your name at the bottom of any of the pages, put your name and then whatever other information. I think there's an email and a phone number. If you'd put those in there, that'll just help us out. If you come a second time, your name will be on there and it'll be easy for you to just find and check. Uh, let us know that you're here so we can, again, just kind of keep up and see what people are doing and where they're going. And uh, tonight, after I pass that out, I've also got a handout that I'm going to pass out. And so I'll, I'll hand that right behind the clipboard. Take one for yourself and pass those around as well. Um, that's, um, at the end of tonight, I don't know that we're going to get to everything on the handout. But if we do get to it, it will be valuable for you to hold it instead of just hearing us talking about it. It's too much to put on slides. And it's also worth a value that if you took it home and read it apart from this, it would be valuable to you, okay? And so that's what we've got going on tonight. I think that's all of my preliminary stuff. Doc, you want to pray for us to get started? Sure. Father, we're so grateful we can be here tonight together as a family. We're going to talk about things that are just so important for the way that you designed us to tick. So I pray that you help us to listen with sharp minds and tender hearts. Receptive to whatever your spirit urges us. We're just waiting for your care and your direction. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to start by just revisiting some of the some of the thoughts, some of the big ideas that we discussed or uh, or or listened to, I guess, on Sunday morning. Starting with uh, your wedding vows. I'm genuinely curious. I want arms like raised to let me know. How many of you remember your wedding vows? Now, that's a weird question. I remember because we used the classic. You use a classic, all right. I've done a lot of marriages and I've used the same vows, so okay. I remember mine. Fantastic. How many of you who didn't raise your hands used the classics and you still don't remember? <laughs> there we go. There we go. We're at a disadvantage because we do, like, you know, we do weddings all the time, so it's a little bit of a refresher for us. You say you remember your vows? So Ben um, had said Sunday that he had made me a present and had put the wedding vows on a nine slotted frame in our bedroom. It just so happened to be on my side of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> so after marriage arguments that sometimes maybe you guys don't have, but we do have, I would go in and I would just be fuming and I would go in and I would read them accidentally because they're just hanging there. So, yes, I remember them. <laughs> All right. There we go. For those of you keeping score, that's the first backfire for Ben right there. There we go. I don't consider that a backfire. I think that's strategic. That's <laughs> yeah, strategic. Absolutely. Good. All right. Uh, man, I... Doc and I, we, 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 when you perform weddings, you kind of have vows out in front of you. I'm doing a wedding this weekend. It's kind of right out in front of you. You kind of see those things all the time. And yet, I don't know that I very frequently consider those promises that I've made. Even if I can remember them, I don't know how frequently I consider uh, whether or not I'm fulfilling them, which is a different level of, of a remembering, right? It's one thing to remember. It's another thing to do. Um, and so I, for me, that was a, a little bit of a convicting thing. Uh, sometimes when we preach, we convict ourselves, all right? And so that was a little bit of a convicting thing. 
seeing all that kind of stuff. Um, I also think about this word love. And whenever I, t- or whenever I sit down with, um, with a young couple who's ready to get married and they're engaged and they're wanting to do some of like premarital counseling, one of the questions I always ask them is, why do you love your fiance? Okay, so we got that question up there. I want you to pause. I'm not going to give you their answers. I want you to pause. I want you to think through how you would answer that question. Even years later, all right, now that, you know, if you've been married for two or 20 or 200 years, all right, how would you answer that question? Why do you love them? What is it about them that makes you love them, right? And I almost always got the same answers. Okay, so here's the answers I get. You you see if these match with you any, all right? But typically I would get answers like, well, they love me or they're nice, <laughs> okay? They're, they're kind, they're, they're, they're gentle, they're sweet, right? They care about me. Uh, they maybe even, they serve me, they meet my needs, they take care of me, right? One of the flaws with answering or asking this question, why do you love them? And the answers that we get back is that oftentimes they're very self-centered answers, I love them because of what they do for me, is essentially 99% of the answers. Doc, would you say anything different to that? You know, as long as they are taking care of us, feeding our needs and so forth, we love them. As soon as we stop, we go to somewhere else and grow. Yeah. Um, and that, that's kind of a model for love that is ubiquitous. Yeah. And that kind of fits, right? Like that's in, be, I think because of this thinking, that's typically then how we define love, is all about what we get out of something and then because I'm getting something, then I'll return it back with love, okay? We'll say that we love something. Um, and I think that's significant. Would you have any different answers to that? No, I agree. Okay, all right, good. Okay, uh, I have to think about like even the five love languages that speak to the ways that we receive love, the ways that we give love, what that looks like. Uh, here, here's an interesting thing, and I think this is probably gonna come back up on this upcoming Sunday, but a man marries a woman hoping that she never changes. And a woman marries a man hoping that he won't stay the same, <laughs> right? Okay. We talk about, you know, love. Why do you love them? What does that look like? Ben, you got a, a comment already? Yeah, we have a question back right here. Yep. I was just curious, um, is there a difference between what women say and what men say for, to the answer to that question? Men tend to answer this of, of the things that I listed, men will tend to answer with ways in which she serves him. And women will tend to answer in ways in which he emotionally cares for her. Um, they're both self-centered, but that would be kind of the unique, from my experience. Doc, would you say anything different to that? It's going to sound rude, but it depends on whether they're already engaged in sexual experiences. Um, if they're already engaged in sex, um, it changes the way they think about each other. It, uh, uh, and usually there's an element of irrationality in their rationale. Um, but you can, it's pretty easy to see. Um, uh, if it's, but I would say, yeah, there's a difference in the reasons guys will give compared to the reasons ladies will give. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All of this to say that it, we struggle with defining love, all right? Because we often make it about an emotion that I feel because of what's done for me. We don't necessarily think of it as a command, which is in, a, a very interesting thing. I think a right answer uh, or, or a more right answer for why do you love them would be something along the lines of because I'm supposed to, <laughs> because, because it's commanded of me, because Jesus says I'm supposed to love this person. That's a better answer. Now, some people are easier to love than others, but that's more of the right answer. And all of that gets back to our definitions for love, all right? The Greek language helps out with this a lot. The word agape uh, is that key word that we honed in on. We call this the highest form of love. It's the self-sacrificial type of a love. It's a loyal type of a love. If I were gonna find a song for you to help you understand this type of love, I would encourage you to go home and listen to a song by Clint Black from the 90s. It's called Something That We Do. You guys remember that song? No. Any of you? No. You don't remember that one, Doc? I don't remember any Doc, 
Doc, I'll buy you lunch tomorrow if you know any of these songs I'm about to mention. Because <laughs> it's not going to happen. But Clint Black, yeah, Clint Black, something that we do. You remember the song? It says, love isn't something that we have, it's something that we do. That's one of the lines, right? You, want, you know the song? No. You don't know the song? I've never heard it in my life. That's not true. I'm pretty sure I've played it for you at some point. I'm pretty sure. All right. But again, it's the it's whole spirit of it's not an emotional thing that we do. It's not based out of what we get. It's based off of what we give. Love is something that we give that we care for somebody else with in that kind of way. We also talked about eros love, which is more passionate. It can be as frivolous as bacon and tacos like we talked about Sunday. It typically is much more romantic or sexually uh, charged as far as the word is considered, okay? So some of you aren't my age. Maybe you had kids my age, all right? But back in the 90s, there was this band of, of boys. They were called Boys to Men. You guys familiar with them? They sang these love ballads with the harmonies. It was beautiful. It, it grabbed women's hearts. They had a song called I'll Make Love to You, which is exactly what it's about, <laughs> all right? So I won't repeat all the lyrics of that one, okay? But that's the spirit of that song, the passionate, uh, typically sexually charged kind of love. Are you familiar with that song, Doc? I don't know the song. No, no, all right. <laughs> Doc doesn't know that one either. All right. We'll try a third one. Do you know that one? Yes. Okay, all right. We know that one. Yes, but I want to say, I think that other line in that is, I'll make love to you like you want me to. And I, I, I just think that's important. I said I wasn't going to read all the lines. I know, but those are just, that's just the next line. <laughs> all right. And I think that's why women like it. That's why women like because it. Because they want what they want, you know. So. Okay, all right. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. We also talked about phileo love, which is that friendship love, okay, uh, between friends. This is an older song. Some of you can remember this one. This is a Stevie Wonder song. That's what friends are for. Remember that song? Okay, Doc, you know that one? No. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. We play a fun game on staff with Doc all the time where we all talk about music and then 100% of the time, if it's not classical, he has no clue. Like, and he doesn't want to know. It's not even like he, like he wants and he's just not good at it. I think he intentionally chooses not to remember these it's things. It's a waste of brain. Yeah, it's a waste of brain. Fair enough. All right. But those are the kind of loves. There's different love songs written about these kinds of relationships, these types of loves. And again, we talked about that agape type of a love. Now, what's interesting about agape is that we talk about it being um, not emotion. It's more of a choice. Well, can you go back for just a second? Yeah. There's one a point you make that I didn't see in the notes coming, but I wanted to reassert it because it was really, really important. Okay? Mm-hmm. you got to go back now. There you go. Ben made the point that if this leads, the, the relationship is going to fail eventually. If this leads, even if this one leads, the, the relationship will eventually fail. The only one that holds the others together and actually heightens the others is this one. If this is what leads, Eros is better and Philippo is better and they last. If these lead, then they're going to fade. Now, you can challenge that if you want, but just stop thinking about it. Start thinking about people. Start thinking about relationships that you've watched. Okay? Eros, you know, eventually you get old, right? Uh, <laughs> Eventually, someone's cuter. That's b bottom line. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. That's why you make fun of your teenagers. Uh, is because they, they really like that passionate kind of a romantic relationship, but they're not really interested in self-sacrificial anything. Right? But the, the ironic thing is that if this leads, these get better. They don't get worse. If they lead, they fail. That was a point that Ben made that I thought was just, you've got to catch that one. It's, a, it's an extraordinarily important thing. Yeah, and we're not, we're not being, um, oh goodness, we're not just randomly saying which love we think is best. They're built on, on this kind of a foundation. It's, it's not my, my preference or my opinion is that agape is, is better. It's that when agape love exists, it enhances the other types of loves. The other types of loves may be, uh, may be uh, at a high level or, or great, but they eventually fade out on their own because there isn't something more substantial to them. There isn't something keeping them going. And that's that agape type of a love. 
Uh, now, we, we also said this, agape isn't about emotion, but it does have emotion. And this was something I didn't get to, to talk about on Sunday morning. We talk about agape being a decision of self-sacrifice, putting someone else before yourself or above yourself, but that doesn't mean that it is devoid of emotion. There's still a lot of emotion involved in this list of what love is. This is, again, from that 1 Corinthians 13 passage, lists out the different kind, or, or, or lists out what love is. And so it's patient, kind, rejoicing in truth, protecting, trusting, hoping, persevering. There are emotional components involved in all of those words. And so just to suggest that agape is not emotion-based does not mean that it is emotionless. And I think that's important. It really is important. One of the things that uh, early on when you were, were studying agape, I always considered it a Spock-like love. Now, that is something I understand. Spock is a Star Trek, right? Um, Spock, where it's emotionless, just logical, rational, okay? Um, agape love doesn't mean it's, it's just that rational commitment devoid of emotion. You're actually giving your heart intentionally to a person giving your heart to that person. It's, if it is completely devoid of emotion, something is missing. If it's driven by emotion, it doesn't, it's not agape. Okay? And that's one of those things. It's, it's, a, it's a rich love. Um, it's not something that is just shallow and, one, and, and two-dimensional. Okay? Good chance, and I moved that speaker around because I can't hear you, Doc. We moved them out earlier because it was ringing and we didn't want it to catch, but I just moved it back so that I could hear what you were saying. So, well, not what you're Go ahead. so far, well, no, no, I appreciate what you're saying there. I heard what you were saying there. That was good. Um, even when you talk about the opposite of love, so even as you look at the other list, you'll see that all of these things have an aspect of emotion with them as well. So you think of envy, boastful, proud, rude, self-seeking easily angered, keeping record of wrongs, delighting in evil. There are emotional components of those things as well. So as we talk about what agape love is and isn't, uh, we say it's not based on emotions, but they still have that emotional component. Really big here. You start looking at this list. Uh, Eros is envious and proud and keeps records of wrongs. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about a very specific kind of love. This does not define eros. It doesn't even define phileo. It defines agape. It's the, it's the highest kind of love in the scripture. And if you think about it, it's the highest kind of love. Okay? That's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that before, Doc. That's really good. And I always make a big deal about that word in the middle, self-seeking. Because I think that if he hadn't listed all those other words, he could have just said self-seeking and that would have been enough. Because that's what each of those things are. Envy, boastful, proud, rude. They're all self-motivated kinds of uh, uh, thoughts or actions or feelings that are all based on trying to get what you can get for yourself. Um, one other piece about all this, I don't think it goes to the next slide. One other piece about these things, as you think about this, you, you can't command a feeling. So when you think about Paul commanding that we love one another and then using these examples, you can't command a feeling, but you can command an action. And so, again, as we see these, these have emotional components, but this word agape really is all about action, the ways in which we treat other people. Self-sacrifice has very practical application to it. Uh, loving someone in that kind of a manner is a very practical, applied type of a love, um, and is very, very straightforward. Good example, man, is if, if, you, if there's anybody in your life that really annoys you, Okay? You may not have that, but in a church of size, there's going to be a few, like, you know, a lot of people. But the fact is, you can agape a person who annoys you. You can agape a person you don't particularly like. You understand? Mm -hmm. As far as to say, do I have to feel like I like them? No. You really don't. Not for agape. Now, if you keep on treating a person like, the fact is, it opens the door to a change in emotion. If you choose a God before you feel the other kinds of love, and there's a much better chance that they will follow along, okay? But you just got to understand, you know, this, this kind of a thing, it, it isn't driven by the emotion. You can't command an emotion. You can command a God that God commands it. I just had a thought. 
I'm not put you on the spot here. But when you think about um, men typically are less emotional and, and are less uh, feeling based. So even as we talk about agape love being something that isn't actually based off emotion, what, what stands out in all that to you, Christina, as you're hearing all that from a woman's perspective? Um, when, when Doc was talking, I was thinking about how um, when Ben and I got married, the minister, he had a red towel over his, his shoulder the whole entire time. A, and, a dish towel. Yeah, a dish towel. Yeah. And um, his, his challenge to us was when things get difficult, pick up the towel. And mainly it means to serve, serve him, serve her. When things get hard, pick it up. And it, we had the towel for a really long time. We and wore it any, out. any time <laughs> that things were getting really hard in marriage, because it does, it it's, can get really difficult. If I would myself, I'm speaking only myself, if I would pick up the towel and serve him, like what you were saying, the action of the obedience of knowing that I am supposed to love him, everything else then does come. Now, it doesn't come the very next day, and it might be weeks. But pick up the towel and serve him humbly, not self-seekingly, not because, but because you're supposed to, because God has called me to do that. That's what I was thinking. No, that's great. And, you know, I think you kind of alluded to this, Doc. This isn't about marriage. This is about being a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, like, there's, we see this applied in marriage. The, the, the phrasing that we're using from Doc that we'll see probably through this whole series is this idea that marriage is the gymnasium of the soul. All right, marriage is a place where this is maybe toughest, all right? But, but this is true of any sort of relationship with, that you have with anybody, and for that matter, anybody that you'll ever see, anyone you'll ever lay eyes on, anyone who's ever existed. To be a follower of Jesus means that you love, and it's not contingent on their behavior. It's not dependent on them loving first. It's none of that kind of stuff. I know for sure that that stuff's gonna come back up again this upcoming Sunday, but it, it's not an act based off of things happening the right way, so now I'll love you. It's saying, because of who Jesus is, I'm going to love you. Does that make sense? That's a different kind of a, a twist to it, and it's a, the conscious decision that turns into an action, and then all of a sudden, I, I think it's one of those deals, the more you do it, eventually you feel it, right? Like it eventually takes over that emotional piece as well. All right, let's keep going. We'll, we'll jump into the Ephesians 5.21 passage. We're going to deal with this one a lot more again on, on Sunday coming up. But submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then, okay, so, so one another means both of us are submitting to each other because we've both submitted to Jesus first. Now we're both submitting to one another. And then he lays out what that looks like. And he says, for wives, you respect your husbands. Husbands, you love your wives. Okay? He lays all that out. And then we ask the question, what does it look like for a husband to agape love his wife? What does it look like to love in that kind of a context? And the example that's laid out by Paul is Jesus and his responsibility with the church. Yep. For you, just one thing to, to think about. One of the things that when I'm looking at a text, examining a text, um, I kind of ask why he would tell wives to respect and why he would tell husbands to love rather than say husbands and wives respect and love each other. Because he does. Husbands and wives are supposed to both love and respect each other. Okay? But here, he isolates specifically. Wives, be sure you respect your husbands. Husbands, be sure you love your wives. Why? Because I think and it's going to be tough you know, for, for some of you guys maybe to agree with, but you can be wrong. But the... Uh, <laughs> That's human, by the way. Um, wives struggle to respect husbands because husbands are always very flawed. Right? Husbands struggle to love their wives in a, way, in a way that the wife wants to be loved because, as Ben mentioned earlier, um, how we normally feel and express love is different than the way most ladies feel and express love. And so he specifically, husbands have a harder time, I think, loving their spouse in a way that their spouse feels loved. And I think wives have a hard time respecting their husbands in a way that their husband feels respected. And here's the deal. If a husband does not feel respect, he will never believe that you love him. 
Okay? And they disagree. She'll tell him, I respect you. And he said, no, you don't. And they're both telling you the truth. See this all the time. Okay? So I think that's the reason he, he isolates it. We're both supposed to love and respect each other, of course. You know, this isn't a matter of I have to respect her, but I don't have to love her. Right? Um, but he's, I think he isolates these four a reasons. Again, we're going to jump into that a whole lot more this upcoming Sunday. But again, just as what we said about love, I'll tell you just a little preview for Sunday. It's the same thing with respect. Respect isn't something that's supposed to exist only within a marriage and only from a wife to a husband. We're all expected to respect anyone that we ever interact with, right? These These are behaviors of mature Jesus followers. And Paul's writing to to married couples who want to follow Jesus. And he said, if you want to follow Jesus and you want to be a good married couple, these are the things you have to pay attention to. And then he gives us an example of what loving looks like. I'm sorry, Ben, what do you got? I was just going to add that with love and respect, those also describe what a husband or wife actually needs. When you talk about love, to me, there's a, uh, a strong sense of respect there. Talk to my wife, there's a strong sense of love. So we each have our receptors yeah. that these plug into, and it's, it's not just by accident. Yeah. That's a good point. And there's one other piece uh, on that previous one, the uh, point that Ben made that I thought, again, had to be reinforced. When they said, submit to one another, submit to one another, one of the things that Ben said, uh, argued on, on Sunday, which I thought was a great point, one of the ways that Husbands submit to a wife as to love her in a way that she feels loved. One of the ways that wives submit to their husbands is to respect them in a way that he feels respected. That they're in some fashion unfolding, unpacking what it means to submit to one another. Okay? Which I thought was an interesting point. And again, ways in which they receive it. Mm-hmm. To do it in a way that they don't receive it is to not have done it at all. Which is... It's hard. It's hard to hear. This is one of the things, again, talking to like a, a couple that's not yet married, but they're wanting to try to do it right. We talk about uh, the five love languages from time to time that'll come up, which I think is a great <laughs> little resource. If for nothing else, just to make you think about what makes you feel loved and to know what makes the other person feel loved. Oftentimes what happens is the way that I feel loved is the way that I give love. And that doesn't work very well in our marriage, does it? <laughs> I think that as wives, one of the things, especially, um, I mean, we've only been married for, I don't remember how many years, 20? Almost 20. Almost 20. When you're first, when you first get married, one of the things that is really difficult is expressing how it is that you do feel loved because you just want him to understand you. And one of the things that takes great confidence in yourself and um, you have to just push the anxiety away and, and communicate to him how it is that you feel love, and it changes, doesn't it? I look out here, and so many of you guys have been married so much longer than us. You deserve to speak more than more than me. Um, but it changes. Your seasons of what you're living in changes, and so one, one season, this made me feel like I was loved. One other season, this might. And, and the changing and, and admitting and telling your husband the truth is very important. And typically, you know, you, you talk with a young man and the ways in which a young man typically feels loved is either acts of service or physical touch. Those are, those are the two highest ratings when you think about the five love languages. And so men try to show love by acts of service and physical touch. And I couldn't understand why every time I groped my wife, she didn't appreciate it, right? <laughs> I, it's clear that I love you. Like, that's what I'm trying to show you. And it doesn't... It didn't make sense. When we first got married, I would do the laundry, and I knew she hated the laundry. So I would do the laundry, and she would come home, and I'd be like, hey, <laughs> look what I did. And she said, good, half of it was yours. <laughs> like, it meant nothing to her. It had no value to her. So, like, again, these are the ways in which I was trying to show love. I thought I was doing something great. We show love by the way that we feel love. And it doesn't always match up on the other side. And so an attentiveness to recognizing how I love you needs to be the way in which you receive love. And, and I, think, I think really what's even harder is from a different perspective of a woman, how you respect him needs to be the way in which he actually receives respect. It's really complex in that kind of a way. Ben? Yeah, I was just listening to what Christina was saying. 
And it occurred to me that both men and women need to have an exercise and cultivate empathy uh, towards one another uh, because that seems to be one of the action points of love. It's going to be very difficult to love in any way or to any degree if you're not focused on and in connection with the other person as they sincerely are. Yeah, I think that's a great foundation for that. One of the uh, useful stories when I was younger, uh, one of the big mistakes I made when I was younger, much younger, way, way younger, and I uh, about giving flowers. And I never thought to give her flowers, and every once in a while I give her a flower just because they were gone. And I think maybe she wants the flower or something like that. And it's not romantic, I just, you know, she wants it, I don't know why, but I get her a flower. One day she brought me flowers, and I made the mistake of laughing. <laughs> Christina just looked at me and said, you should be buying me flowers. <laughs> you've never once bought me flowers. Never once. I don't want them, but Julie you've never once. <laughs> I imagine you laughed at her. <laughs> all right. Were you going to say something? No. Okay, all right, good. All right. You're ready, and then you controlled yourself. All right. Men, we got challenged big time this past Sunday. And again, I hope you guys understand that that when I say these things, it's incredibly convicting for me as well, but as we talk about love and as we talk about husbands loving their wives, the example set before us is how Jesus loves the church. It's a really, really high standard, really complicated. And if you wanna ask what it looks like for you to love your wife, these are the things that you ought to care for. These ought to be the things that you're measuring to see whether or not you're actually loving your wife. Do you give yourself up for her? Do you work to make her holy? Are you doing what you can to help purify her? Are you trying to make her presentable to God? Are you protecting her? Are you caring for her daily? These are the things that Paul tells us Jesus does for the church. And he says, husbands, this is your example. This is your standard. It's a very high standard, very daunting to look at, very heavy. Uh, Doc, what are the things that stand out to you in that? Well, this was a fascinating list because uh, one of the ways that Ben led through the text on some is a way that I really hadn't contemplated much as a model. This is what caught me right here. Okay? I think uh, husbands loving your wives, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. But if you love her as Christ loved the church, you actually, does your love make her more holy? Does your love purify her? Does your love prepare her for her meeting God? Now that caught, caught my attention, okay? Because that's not something we usually make as part of the definition of how to love a wife. Does your love for your wife, is it drawing her closer to Jesus? If not, why not? Okay? If his model is our model, um, is your love purifying her? Making her holier, which is more... Christ-like in some fashion. That's, that's not a bad thing, guys. Right? But I, I thought the inclusion of these three in this list, once you use this as a model for how a husband loves a wife, it changes the whole tenor of what loving a wife looks like. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Do you have anything you want to say to that? No. I think the way a lot of guys love their wives drives them away from God. Mm -hmm. Or they just simply don't care about their wife's relationship with God. And that is not love. I just want yeah. yeah. I, I, men typically see their roles as just being, you know, provider. Care. Like you, I, I like what you did, Doc. You, you highlighted that first one and then the last two. Those are very almost physical kinds of things. Those are very practical kinds of things. Those are very simple things to look at and say whether you've done them or not, okay? Did you lock the doors before you went to bed? Yes, all right, I protected her. All right, like it's simple, simple stuff, right? But the, but the idea to ask these questions, am I leading my wife? Am I, am I loving my wife in a way that's leading her towards Jesus? That's, that's a lot more of an ambiguous thing to point to and lay out. Um, it's also way more convicting and complicated to defend. It's a huge standard. Yeah. How, so it, 
making her holy and purifying her, how would you go about doing that? Like, what is it that you would do? I'm serious. <laughs> I know that I can come up with a whole lot more examples on how to make her unholy. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so you want to know what's the devil. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but I can uh, provoke my wife to uh, action, to make it very hard for her to respond to God on her way. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not hard to do. We all know each other's buttons. Julie and I have been married and born 50 years. We know each other's buttons. I know exactly how to hurt her. I know exactly how to make her mad. She does the same thing to me. It's easy. Way easier for me than it is for really much. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, when you talk about how to, how to make her holy, start with, how, what are the ways that you can provoke her to be ungodly? That's, uh, that's an easier question. Now, as far as provoking her to be holy, I, the best way that I know of, um, if you are not God honoring yourself, then you're not a good husband. If you're not pursuing God yourself, then you're not a good husband. By this standard. Does that make sense? Do you, does your family, does your wife and your kids know how important God is to you, being a godly man is to you? Okay? Because if they don't know that, if they don't see it burning somewhere inside of you, I'm not sure that you can do this. Okay? Now, it doesn't have to be done the same way. All of us are very different. Our faiths are very different. Mine tends to be very, very quiet. Okay? Mine is a very, very quiet faith compared to a lot of guys. But I hope my, my family understands how much it means to me. And so when you're talking about moving them towards, you know, loving them, uh, I, if you can view your wife as a child of God and you don't want to make her dad mad, um, if you can see your wife as a child of God and you're going to do whatever you can not to distance your wife from God or have um, from, her, from her Heavenly Father or, or provoke her to disrespect her Heavenly Father, I think those are the kinds of things, places where I would go, at least at the surface. I haven't thought about this deeply, but that's where I start with. I liked what you had to say about the... Uh the personal relationship that you have to have first. Uh, one of the, uh, a quote that I found that'll probably make its way into the sermon this Sunday, probably something we're gonna talk about next Wednesday night, is the idea that my marriage can't move forward if, if we're at a point of conflict, if we're in a place of an unhealthy place, it's hard for this to get healthier if my relationship with God is unhealthy. And so there, there's a sense in which I have to care about my relationship vertically before I care about my relationship horizontally. Um, and I think that's a big part of this. But there's one other piece, okay? A husband can be a, a, a great godly wife. It will not guarantee that a husband's going to be a good god honoring man. A husband can be a great god honoring husband. It will not guarantee that, that his wife is going to be a great god honoring woman. We do what we can to keep him on that path, but we cannot override your free will. Ultimately, you cannot make those choices for your partner, it will break your heart. It oftentimes does break your heart, but you have to understand that I cannot force my kids to be Christian. I cannot force my wife to be Christian. I can't force anybody to be a Christian. I can do what I can not to put roadblocks there. I can do what I can to nudge, but in the end, it's still going to be their responsibility. So some of you guys know that you may have a spouse that, that struggles with God, and you're wondering, am I just now convicting you of misbehaving, which is why your husband is not uh, connected to God? No. Um, it may be that you have pushed them from God. It's possible. Um, but just because your spouse pushes God away doesn't mean that it's on you. It's still on them. Make sense? There's still that component of free will. We talked about that privately last week. Um, and one of the lines I said, and I, I struggled a little bit with this, and I, I believe what I said in my sermon, but there is like an asterisk next to it, okay? And so I, I said at the end, I said, husbands, your wife's soul is in your hands. And I believe that in the sense that I will be held responsible for how I've led my wife by loving her towards him. But she is a free entity. She decides what she does with her life and what she does with her soul. And so there, there's a sense in which that's true. If someone were to push back against that and suggest that it was overstating it, I could probably agree to that. Um, there, there's still that individuality to there. We have so much more to get to, guys, and it's 710. All right.
uh, we're using a book for this series called Sacred Marriage. It's written by a guy named Gary Thomas. I quoted him a couple times this Sunday. You'll hear even more from him this upcoming Sunday. There's another book that I wanted to lay out to you just to see. It's called Marriage. It's written by a guy named Paul Tripp. A uh, very, very smart, sharp guy. Uh, he had some stuff and some, some things that he did specifically with love that are going to be kind of not necessarily brand new ideas, but take us in a little bit different direction than what we talked about Sunday to just kind of give us a larger, more full picture, all right? At the beginning of one of his chapters, as he talks about love in the context of marriage, he had this quote, which I thought was really good. Love at first sight is easy to understand. It's when two people have been looking at each other for a lifetime that it becomes a miracle. Right? Any of you feel that? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I jump in on that real quick. Yeah. Randy's our preaching partner. He's, uh, he's jumped, joined our little cluster of band that Randy and I have been preaching partners for a long, long time. And uh, Randy will make the case that it is harder to love till death do us part today than it ever has been before. And the reason is we live longer. <laughs> There was a time when the normal lifespan might have been 50 years old, and you only had to death to your part for 20, 30 years. <laughs> Anybody can hang in there for 20 years. Yeah. Swift and soon. <laughs> <laughs> but 50 years, 50 years, okay? Now, his case, he's in the, and he has a point, okay? Till death to your part. You put it in the context of 50 years, yeah, right? Um, we've had couples in this church as long as 70 years. That's that's an entirely different assignment, isn't it? It's a yeah, it is. It's a, yeah, it's a long it's lifetime. A it's, okay. At one point in history, that would have been two lifetimes. But that's why. That's why Eros can't do it. Paletto can't do it. If it's not agape, this cannot happen. Okay. Now, what, what you see a lot of times with older marriages are people who don't want to get divorced because they don't want to disrespect God, but they simply live under the same roof, but they're not really a couple anymore. They simply exist as roommates, oftentimes caustic roommates. That's not what we're talking about. It is, it is not uh, a celebration when a couple has been able to tolerate each other for 50 years. <laughs> Okay? Yeah. We're talking about something much deeper than that. Yeah. Well, and, and Tripp starts out with this. He lays out how to tell when you're in a love drought. What are the indicators that tell you that maybe la uh, that love is lacking in your relationship? Okay, typically we can feel this, but he gives it names to help us out. And so the first one he mentions is disunity, uh, which I thought was a very interesting place for him to start. He says this, he says, unity is not the result of sameness. Oftentimes when we think about being united, we see that as we're in agreement. He says not necessarily. He said unity results when love intersects with difference. So when there's actual difference, but we agree on where we're wanting to go, that's actually a sign of unity. Not necessarily agreement in the, in the direct, okay, but, but an agreement that we're gonna do this together regardless, okay? That's a sign of unity. He also, he also offers this, he self self-love, so the opposite of, of this agape love, this self-sacrificial love, the opposite of it, and when it comes to disunity, self-love hates difference. You think about our culture that we live in right now, this is, when I read this, this is what it made me think of. You think about the series that we just finished here recently, uh, talking about gender and sexuality and some things that would have been in, in some sharp conflict and contrast with our culture that we're in, and one of the popular refrains is, if you don't uh, support what I do. If you don't, um, what's the word? I went blank. It starts with an A. Affirm. affirm. If you don't affirm what I'm doing, then you don't love me. And what they're saying is, if there's any difference in us, then we can't love. And that's not actual love. That's self-love. That's, that's selfishness. Uh, real love says, we have lots of differences and I still love you anyway. There's a unity that exists despite our differences. Just a, another point on this one. One of the things is we're not we're not nearly as old as Vern, and but, uh, <laughs> but you discover um, till the day we die, Julia and I are not going to see the world the same on many different things. Okay, we're never going to achieve agreement on many many different things. 
You see the world differently. You think differently. Does that make sense? You would think over time that I would win, but I didn't. <laughs> the fact that we don't see the world the same does not mean that we are not united. That's the key. It's not a matter of finally seeing the world exactly the same. We never will. Okay? It's that we can love each other and support each other despite the fact that we're going to have differences till the day we die. Okay? And so this disunity, don't misunderstand that. It's not about all of a sudden one person or the two coming to seeing the world the same on, on everything that they do life with. It's not going to happen that way. And, and the real issue here is not just that you disagree on something, it's that you live in a state of disunity where you're consistently in disagreement on that. Uh, likewise, the second one, misunderstanding. Love in a relationship is going to long for the two of you to be on the same page. It's not that you're having misunderstandings, it's that are you accepting of your misunderstandings? Does it hurt when you misunderstand each other or have you become so numb to it that it doesn't even register with you anymore? When you misunderstand each other, it should still cause that pain because love wants you to still be on the same page. It wants you to work that out. Self-love makes you more committed to what you understand than to understanding your spouse. Is that interesting? Uh, the opposite of love is saying, I'm going to focus more and more on what I understand and get you to understand it, as opposed to working to understand you, um, overcoming those kinds of things. Have you ever listened to an argument when you know that neither one of them is listening to the other, they're just waiting for the other to take a breath so they can make their point? Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, I need you to stop eavesdropping on my house. All right, se <laughs> separation. Love finds separation unacceptable and painful. Okay? Uh, one of the unique things about our marriage, I am, uh, I call myself a professional extrovert. I can do this kind of stuff. I can talk to people. I can be outgoing. I can even be the center of attention. It exhausts me. When I go home, I need to crash. Okay? Uh, she is more extroverted uh, in a real way, not a professional way, all right? And so, like, she, she wants time for me, whatever else. In those rare occasions where maybe she takes the kids to her parents' house or something and she's gone for a few days, I feel like I get life, <laughs> all right? Like, it's, it's good for me, all right? I like some of the quiet and the, the, the even almost loneliness of it, right? But, and this is a key part of this. She doesn't know where I'm going with this, right? But the important thing is eventually that wears off real quick. And I start missing, and I start wishing she was back, all right? And I, I start wanting that relationship. We talk about a marriage situation. If you want to know if love is still there, uh, is there separation, and you're perfectly content with that? Love says that that's unacceptable and even painful. It should hurt, okay? There may be a short time where it's refreshing, but, but it should be painful when you're away from the person that you love. Self-love is a peacefully avoidant lifestyle of cohabitation. If you love yourself more than you do your spouse, you will care more about you getting what you need as opposed to them. And you'll, you'll even appreciate separation in that kind of a long-term long, long -term kind of a way. Uh, physical dysfunction is exactly what it sounds like. If your relationship isn't a daily act of love, there's little chance that sex will be. That's just kind of a practical sense. Love lives in awe of the holiness of the sexual relationship in marriage. There should be a physical component of that. And we talk about sex, and I think we all understand what sex is, but there's so many different parts of it, that just the, the interaction that takes place throughout the day that isn't actually sex, but is sexual, if that makes sense, all right, that are all these signs of love. You got something to say? And it's not the groping. It's not the groping, yeah. No. Yeah, we covered that already. We learned. Sure. We learned, right, yeah. But there's that component, right? Okay, there's always going to be, or there should be a sexual component, a physical component of the relationship. Self-love objectifies the physical. If you're only in it for yourself, then you're only looking to see what you can get. And so that's the opposite. So you're, again, we're trying to see when love is there and when love isn't there. And then finally, conflict. Again, every marriage is going to have conflict. Love loves peace and hates conflict. Conflict's going to exist. Do you hate it? Is it painful? Is it hard? Do you want to resolve it because that's not the place you want to live? If you've become comfortable in the conflict of your relationship, 
you are definitely living in a love drought. Does that make sense? Okay, you've become ambivalent, and love doesn't exist there. Anything else from those that you want to point out, Doc? Anything you want to say? Anything else? You're good? Yeah. All right. We're going to fly through this next section, okay? I'm going to show you uh, what I have over the course of uh, seven slides here is the first John passage four, starting in verse seven through 21, okay? It's a lot. Uh, I hate doing this, okay? But I'm going to skip through it because I believe that you're probably capable of reading. And if you don't know how to read, you can probably find someone that will read this to you, okay? So I'd encourage you to go back and read this. But this next little section that we're going to talk about is coming directly out of this passage, okay? So let me get to where we're going. All right. Tripp in his book, Marriage, when he deals with this passage, he comes to this at the end, and he says, love defined. Our best definition of love is from an event. That's this First John 4 passage. Our best understanding of what love is is rooted in an event. Agape. This agape love. It's rooted in an event that takes place with Jesus on the cross. We understand that? Okay. So whenever we try to define it, we have to define it out of those parameters. That's our best understanding. The best example we've ever seen is rooted in an event. So because of that, he then offers this definition, which I like a lot because it looks a lot like the one we used on Sunday. He said, love is willing self-sacrifice for the good of another that does not require reciprocation or that the person being loved is deserving. We're going to break this down almost word by word, okay? Love, love is willing. It's worth noting that Jesus died on the cross willingly. There are some who would argue that, that he was taken against his will, that he was forced onto that cross, that he was murdered uh, in, in, uh, in, a, uh, in an authoritative type of a way. Jesus doesn't say that, and the rest of the New Testament doesn't say that. And I think that if you believe in Jesus, you wouldn't subscribe to that either. Uh, he willingly allowed himself to be subdued by men. Uh, he, he started with a self-sacrifice, and he did so willingly. You cannot force someone to love you. You cannot be forced to love. It starts with your own willingness to love. Does that make sense? Okay? Rooted deeply in that. The next piece is that self-sacrifice. It's not just a willingness, but it's a willingness to sacrifice of self. Again, we're talking about this agape love. And you go back to that 1 Corinthians passage of patience, kind, rejoicing in truth, protecting, trusting, hoping, persevering. None of those words are selfish. All of those words actually cost you something. You actually lose something in those things. It is, it is a self-sacrificial type of a way. Okay? Go. One, one, one thought on that What's interesting about self-sacrifice of love is that people sometimes say that love costs too much. People who refuse to pay the cost live little lives. Here's the, here's the paradox. If you choose to love, your life gets bigger. A lot of people, because they know the pain of love, choose not to love. Their life gets smaller. It costs, but it grows a person. Does that make sense? When you start living for something bigger than yourself, life matters. When you just live for yourself, your life is little. That's, that's the oddity of this thing. It's self-sacrifice. But the whole idea, of, and if you're self-sacrificing so you look good, that's not self-sacrifice. Genuine sa self-sacrifice makes you the kind of person God makes you to be. And you become a giant. Does that make sense? And he goes on, he says, for the good of another. It's self-sacrifice for the good of another, not for the self, because again, that would be selfishness, all right? But for the good of another. Love always has the good of someone else in view, okay? If it's for yourself, if it's something that you can get out of it, then it's not really love, it's, it's something completely else. Love means that you're putting someone else's needs out in front of your, yourself, and it does not require reciprocation. I think this is one of the biggest, most important pieces of this does not require reciprocation, meaning my love for you is not dependent on your ability to love me first. My love for you isn't dependent on you deserving it. My love for my wife is not dependent on her meeting my expectations of what a wife should be. My love is set up as something that is willing on my part, self-sacrificial for the sake of her, 
and it doesn't require reciprocation. She doesn't have to do it back for me to continue to love her. Let me jump in real quick here, Ben. I've been in a lot of counseling sessions where husband or wife will tell me that the other person simply doesn't deserve it. Okay? Got it. And they're always right. That's they're 100% of the case, they're right. You don't deserve it. Yeah. And your spouse doesn't deserve it. I've given my spouse more than enough reason to, to divorce me many, many times. Right? We don't deserve it. Okay? And, but you try to tell them to act the love anyway. And they'll say, well, I'll try it to see if it works. <laughs> if they try it to see that it works, it is not agape love. Because it does not require reciprocation. Are you willing to try it even if they never love you back the way that you want them to? Because if you're going to love them this way to see if they're going to love you back the way you want them to, it is not yet selfless. If you use it as a tool, as a ploy, okay, then it's not agape. Agape love is towards the undeserving. And if it requires reciprocation, which basically means I'm going to try it, it's a tactic to see if I can get them to be, behave the way that I want them to, okay, then you're missing the point. That's a hard to get people to understand. So hard, okay? But what's helpful is that the Bible tells us that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. He didn't he wait for us. He never loved him back. Yeah, he didn't wait for us to figure it out. He didn't wait for us to love him. And he's like, okay, now I'll, now I'll do something for you. Right? He took care of us when we were still way short of the line. Right? Took care of us. And then... Yeah, he loves us because of who he is, not because of who we are yeah. or how we respond. And that's the same kind of love he wants us to give because of who we are, not because of who they are. Yeah. And then he finishes with this with saying, or that person being loved is deserving. Again, what we're talking about here. I promise you that your spouse isn't deserving. <laughs> right? Is your spouse deserving? Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Most of the time? Most of the time. No, 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 not most of the time. I think that marriage that we we're talking about with uh, loving how we're supposed to, it's a, it's a high call to just obedience. It's a, it's, a, it's a deciding that when you wake up that morning, you are going to love him whether or not he makes the bed or does the dishes. You're going to love him whether or not it's worse than that. And I think that it's, um, it's difficult, but if done how it's described, um, the rewards are more than you can imagine. Yeah. Christ was willing to go to the cross and carry our sin precisely because there was nothing that we could ever do to return it. We couldn't earn it, we couldn't achieve it, we couldn't deserve it, we couldn't give it back. But he did it for us. So again, this is the standard. When it comes to loving your spouse, this is what it looks like. It's not because they deserve it. It's not because they earned it. You know, when you're getting married and, and, you know, why do you love someone? It's, oh, well, they're nice to me or they serve me or whatever else. No, that's not what we love. We love because we're told to love, because we're called to love, because Jesus loved me and I want to live a life in honor and respect to him. It's going to lead me to love other people who don't deserve my love as much as we don't deserve his love. And yet we still love anyways. That's consistently choosing. It's that choice piece. Ben? Um, listening to the, the discussion about sacrifice, self-sacrifice, and uh, focusing on the needs of the other person, um, I think that instead of that being the point that you try to arrive at or what you, you uh, aspire to, it's more a feeling of treasuring the privilege of loving someone. <laughs> and guys, you can use that if you ever need yeah. to. It's public domain. Yeah. That's a beautiful thought. I wish I thought that way. <laughs> it doesn't always feel like a privilege, does it? When you're trying to love someone. I think of my kids. I love my kids so much. I'm so grateful for them. It doesn't always feel like a privilege to love them, does it? <laughs> Sometimes it's just work. You have the same kids. Do you feel the same way? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. One of us needs to be better than the other. Good. Here you go. Last thing. And I, said, I mentioned this earlier. I thought that this was maybe for the sermon. I was working on this today and sermon for Sunday. And so they, they crossed paths. So this may show up and it may not. But we must fix our marriages vertically before we can ever fix them horizontally. 
that we're working on that relationship with God, if, if both of us, and we've seen this in our marriage, when we're both seriously pursuing a good relationship with Jesus at the same time, it's amazing how much easier our marriage gets. And I, I wouldn't say it is easy. I would just say easier, right? Yeah, and I think that that's what um, makes it actually last. Mm. You know, you have to be really serious about it. Oh, there's no way in the world we would still be married if we both weren't committed to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes staying married has been a very simple act of obedience. Act of obedience to Jesus. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we are out of time, but I want to draw your attention to this. I told you we probably wouldn't get to it. The paper I gave you was uh, a list that uh, Paul Tripp puts together in his book, Marriage, and it's called Marital Love in Action. It's a long list. All right. If you look, it's a front and back. I think it's 22, 23, something like that, different bullet points that he has. Uh, and it's all like if you're if there's any part of you that is still curious or wondering hey give me more example of what this can look like what is love and what isn't love he makes it very clear just very simple straightforward statements I want to draw your attention uh, just very briefly to number 18 just because there's an extra little note under that one It says, love is staying faithful to your commitment to treat your spouse with appreciation, respect, and grace, even in moments when he or she doesn't seem to deserve it or is unwilling to reciprocate. Uh, not one, that might, mean to, that might need to say no one, I'm not sure, has been or ever will be married to a perfect person. I think that's correct, not one. Not one has ever been or ever will be married to a perfect person. Marriage means that the sin weaknesses and failure of your husband or wife will be your firsthand daily experience. That's a really harsh statement, isn't it? Okay? It is normal to deal with the sin of your spouse. That's not, that's not abnormal, that's the normal. The perspective that we need to have is understanding that love is sometimes just that simple act of obedience and faithfulness that I'm going to be committed to treating them the right way regardless of whether or not they deserve it or they're going to reciprocate it back. Um, and that's a big challenge. Again, that's just one example. He's got, what is it, 22? Lots of them. Be the kind of thing that you could look over, spend some time. If you're really bold, maybe look at that with the spouse. Uh, maybe, maybe put that up somewhere. Maybe mark days of the month and see if you can't practice each one of those specifically on a certain day. That'd be really cool. I'm going to put this one on your side of the bed. <laughs> As you should. As you should. Uh, that's it. We're, we're done for tonight. We'll continue on next week uh, going on with this. Doc, why don't you pray for us? I will. I just want to say one thing before I pray. This sounds burdensome. I tried saying this earlier. This doesn't make no harder. It makes it richer. It makes you better. You live for little and you become little. You live for big and life becomes more precious. Okay? This stuff is not, God didn't design it this way, it's a burden to us. He set high standards, he gave tough instructions, but if you do it his way, your life will be better, okay? Yeah, let me, let me add just a little bit on that. Wouldn't you wives love to be married to someone like this? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Like this, this isn't a, it, it is hard, but it's better. When you do it, 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 it pays off. And guys, I promise, it, it pays off. It's good. When you, when you love well, it's amazing how things fall into place when a relationship gets healthy. Yeah, my wife thinks it's way better. Yeah. Let me go ahead and pray. Father, we're grateful for the patience of these folks as we're talking about some very tough things. And we do understand, Lord, too, that this isn't just about marriage. It's just how we're supposed to treat each other. We're supposed to be people who reflect a, an almost supernatural kind of love. It takes your help. It takes your, it takes your wisdom. So I pray that you help us to lean on you and reach for that which is way better. In the name of Christ we pray these things. Amen.